like my Hey, everybody, it's Paris. Just want to thank you for uh, being here. And uh, Delmarie, Felicia, great to see you again. Jaime, thank you for yeah. being here. I don't know that I've met you before. And it is Jaime, not Jamie, right? Jaime Dominguez? Yeah, Jaime. Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. And um, Good to- what was that? Good to hear your voice. Good to hear your voice, Paris. Yeah, unfortunately, you won't see me, Delmarie. Hopefully, I'll be able to see you all, but uh, you'll... How's everything in Bronzeville? We're hanging in there. We haven't had any problems. No so problems? My, fin- my fingers are crossed. All right, here we go. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, after a whole lot of speculation, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden picks Kamala Harris as his running mate. We take a closer look at this history-making choice. You are dealing with the collective mental stress of the people. Consequences and cleanup from the widespread looting. Plus, cleanup from last night's wild storm, an atmospheric scientist on how the derecho ripped through the Midwest. Who should get Chicago's TIF surplus? Two aldermen debate how to spend the funds. The legality of President Trump's move to ban the Chinese-owned social media app TikTok. Can colleges and universities safely open for fall classes amid COVID-19? A new mural along the Riverwalk explores Art Deco architecture in Chicago. What if I never get famous and never get money and I am stuck smoking? An open mic organized by high schoolers on the south side. And there's a new headliner in the sky. Details on when and where you can catch the Perseid meteor shower tonight. But first, despite a comparatively quiet Monday night, city officials are blocking off access to downtown once again. Brandis Friedman has more on that and other top stories from the day. Brandis. Yeah, that's right, Paris. So starting in about two hours, access to the downtown area will again be restricted overnight. Access to the downtown area is not a curfew. All residents, workers and employees whose businesses are located downtown will have access at all times. As part of the restricted access, the same closures will be in effect overnight as were last night. The city says after yesterday's property damage and civil unrest, it's implementing a quote neighborhood protection plan across all Chicago communities, which includes restricted access to the loop from nine tonight until six tomorrow morning. The Office of Emergency Management and Communication says it's also strategically positioning what are called infrastructure assets around the city to protect commercial corridors and critical businesses like grocery stores and pharmacies. The Illinois Department of Public Health announces another 1,500 confirmed cases of the coronavirus and an additional 20 deaths. The state's new case total now stands at nearly 197,000 and more than 7,600 deaths. Additionally, travelers to and from Kansas, Utah and Iowa are no longer required to quarantine for 14 days after returning from those states. The city has removed them from its quarantine list. 20 others, though, shown here, remain. And the pandemic is forcing next week's Democratic National Convention to be unconventional this year. But today we're learning that the headlining speakers will include two of Chicago's own. Monday night, former First Lady Michelle Obama will be the headlining speaker, followed by former Second Lady Jill Biden on Tuesday night. Wednesday evening, former President Barack Obama will close out the night. And of course, former Veep Joe Biden is expected to accept his party's nomination. Now with more on Biden's pick to be his Veep, here's Paris. 
That's right, Brandis. It's official. Vice President Joe Biden has picked California Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate, calling her a fearless fighter for the little guy and one of the country's finest public servants. Harris gets a nod over a group of frontrunners that included Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth. A more formal announcement is expected tomorrow. And joining us to help analyze this choice are Felicia Davis, President and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women, Delmarie Cobb, political consultant and founder of Ida's Legacy, a political action committee for progressive black women, and Jaime Dominguez, an assistant professor of political science at Northwestern University. Welcome all of you back to Chicago tonight. Hi, Thank you. Paris. Thank you for having me. All right, let's go down the line here. Initial reactions, starting with you, Delmarie Cobb. Well, I'm very happy. I had just written a column not long ago uh, saying that Biden's pick should be a black woman. And so I am very happy that he chose a black woman, given that African-American women have voted at a rate that outpaces every other identifiable group since uh, 2008. What about that, Felicia Davis? Is this a nod to the fact that African-American women have been the strongest sort of Democratic Party voting bloc? I think so, and I'm excited, like Del Marie, also because um, as a candidate, Kamala really centered women in her, the senator really centered women's and women's issues and a lot of her platforms, and I'm really looking forward to seeing those realized in the White House soon. Jaime Dominguez, your initial reaction? Yeah, I wasn't surprised, but I think it's a good pick. I think uh, it's a good pick in the sense that it's a, a woman, African-American woman, who... Uh, in terms of the political aisle, is kind of left of center. And I think that's going to help to keep the Biden campaign on equal footing on a variety of different issues. It would seem like task number one for the Biden campaign is to win back the industrial Midwest states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin that Clinton lost in 2016. Delmarie Cobb, does Harris help with that effort? Well, those people who were not going to vote for um, Biden aren't going to vote for him anyway. But I think that those people who have decided that the administration that we currently have in the White House has to go, they're going to be more incentivized to turn out and vote. And certainly it's going to give African-Americans more incentive to turn out to vote. And that was what happened in 2016 is that African-Americans stayed home, even though African-American women, 94 percent of them voted for Hillary Clinton. The, a lot of black people did not turn out at the same rate as we know that they did for Barack Obama. So this will help with that turnout, because I believe that you cannot waste a lot of your time on those people who are fair weather Democrats. Felicia Davis, what about that? I mean, you're a Chicagoan, you're a Midwesterner. Uh, is, is this the kind of pick that could resonate with African-Americans in the Midwest to turn out that vote and Midwesterners in general? So I, I, I think so. And I also think that it's important to center a lot of the issues um, for women in the Midwest. And so when you think about health care, um, when you think about gender equity and you think about some of the policies that have been put forth regarding student loan forgiveness, um, women carry the majority of student loan debt in this country because of the issues with structural discrimination around gender equity. So women continue to take out more and more student loans. When we also talk about some of the services like health care and child care and pay time off, I think it's really, um, those are Midwestern, those are hardcore issues that people work working class people really need some relief from. Of course, uh, Jaime Dominguez, uh, Senator Harris has received some criticism from the far left wing of the Democratic Party, supporters of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. They've called her Kamala the cop, noting her experience as California's top, top prosecutor. Could that suppress the vote or the turnout uh, for some of the Warren Sanders voters? Um, perhaps, but I think that she, as I was saying earlier about her bringing the, the campaign to the center. I think, uh, to, to my colleagues' points on this panel here, particularly with the suburbs, I think she's going to do very well for, uh, because we've seen a precipitous decline in, in the Trump support in the suburbs, and, and particularly with women. These are, I think Kamala Harris is a, is a type of candidate because of her story. Uh, she's, she has broken many barriers as being the first, you know, African-American woman to be district attorney of San Francisco. Then she's the first... Uh, when I say Blasian, uh, uh, you know, Attorney General of the State of California, she's the first biracial uh, senator of the State of California. In, in light of you know being in a male-dominated industry or sector, so the fact that she can speak uh, to those issues, I think that women in the suburbs 
uh, will resonate with. I think she has a very good story to tell, and I don't. And I think that she is a, a perfect dra- backdrop to the comments that Trump has been saying about their vote the suburbs. If you will like Biden, their vote the suburbs. I don't think in any way, shape, or form that she's going to present a, a threat or is going to create more anxiety amongst uh, suburban women voters, which I think it's going to be a key demographic in these uh, swing states such as North Carolina, but also the Midwest, right? Um, um, Wisconsin, Ohio, and also Michigan. Del Marie, I mean, the two are, are tight now. She's saying she's, she is Joe Biden's partner. But back during the primary debates, they had some rough exchanges. I think there was one very rough exchange about uh, uh, controversial school busing policies from years and years ago that Biden supported. How does she bridge that gap between then and being an unqualified supporter now? Well, I'm sure a lot of that has taken place already behind the scenes, and that's a good thing. Um, And so one of the things we hope is that um, during this primary period, that's what she will do. During this primary period, she will get on the campaign trail and she will talk about all the reasons why she supports uh, Joe Biden. And also, this means that she's not being deceitful because she has raised those issues when she was running against him. Felicia Davis, there was an article recently, in the last couple hours, in the Daily Beast, saying that the Trump campaign line of attack here will be to portray Senator Harris as, quote, power-hungry and ruthless. Are those attacks that would likely stick? You know, those attacks would not be unexpected. Um, I think the campaign should anticipate is what we've is what we've seen in the past a lot of misogyny and the way in which women candidates are portrayed. I think that uh, Senator Harris's record is strong, um, and I think that we will see more of this divisive language. But I am reminded of our former first lady who said, "When they go low, we go high." I think that this moment in history, this is 100 years after women, some women were given the right to vote and black women historically were left out. This is monumental to have a black woman nominated for our second highest um, office in our country. And so I think in this instance, the, the, that going high and uh, uh, um, focusing on the positive and the policies that will be enacted is the boon for all women across the country, and quite frankly, it's a lift for our entire country although, uh, away from some of the divisive language. Although Harris is notoriously a, a very tough debater and a tough questioner uh, when she's in some of those Senate committee hearings. Jaime Dominguez, the Biden campaign certainly gets a boost today with all the news coverage and the historical nature of this pick, but is there empirical evidence that the VP selection really impacts a campaign? No, voters uh, don't uh, select the president based on who he or she picks. Um, that's been uh, studied over and over. But I think what, what the vice president can do is it can, it can give the campaign just a little bit more mobility and range on issues that perhaps the, in this case, Joe Biden, maybe, you know, perhaps could be a liability. So, for example, on the issue of race relations, we know that Kamala Harris, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, really came down hard on him in terms of right uh, coalescing or, or working with right uh, segregationists in the South on, on particular legislation. I think Kamala Harris it will help to neutralize that conversation. And so I think that for, for the Biden campaign, this is going to be a plus. That she's going to be providing, I think, um, that she's going to be in charge of the messaging right, on, on issues, I think, that perhaps Biden could possibly trip, trip himself over. But again, I think overall, the, the fact that uh, Kamala Harris will be able to speak more holistically to issues that matter to the uh, Biden campaign, but more importantly, that matter to, to, to Americans, such as health care, immigration reform, um, uh, criminal justice reform, et cetera. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. And my thanks to Felicia Davis, Delmarie Cobb, and Jaime Dominguez. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. Businesses and residents are bracing for the chance of future upheaval following widespread theft and property damage on Sunday night. Although Chicago's police superintendent today told reporters that last night was, quote, relatively quiet. Now, as you heard, access to downtown remains restricted overnight and police have extra eyes on neighborhoods. Well, what else is being done in light of the potential for more civil unrest? Amanda Vinicky joins us now with more. Amanda. Yes, Brandis. This afternoon, the CPD announced a new looting task force. So police are asking for businesses, residents, really any witnesses with information about the looting 
to come forward, to contact them, email in any photos or videos of what occurred Sunday night heading into Monday. They even say anonymous tips are welcomed. This is what Police Chief David Brown and Mayor Lori Lightfoot on Monday morning had promised would be coming as they called the looting felony criminal activity that the city would aggressively pursue and penalize. Attorney Tanya Woods of the Westside Justice Center says these threats of consequences says it sounds like the city's sending in stormtroopers. There's that piece like, you know, people feel as though here it go, comes again. Our communities are under siege again, under the color of law, yet again. The, no one wants to live under those conditions. No one wants to feel as though in their own home, they are being hunted, that they are being tracked. So no one is advocating for lawlessness. What she is advocating for, she says, is for the justice system to treat individuals with humanity. She fought for this sort of thing back in May when her son was among those. He, by the way, is a Stanford College graduate, was among the peaceful protesters arrested. What we were demanding then was that people had access to legal counsel in a timely manner, um, that people were safe while they were incarcerated, right? And, and treated in such a way that did not um, offend their human rights. She's calling for it the same now. She also says police need to be mindful when they are rounding up potential or alleged perpetrators, given that we are still in a pandemic. Proper PPE, um, being in a safe environment, you know, these were law enforcement officers that we continue to see not, you know, adhering to the, the, the best practices that we are asked to, right? And then you heard all these people kind of together, you handcuff them and shank, shackle them, you know, in places that then becomes unsafe for them just because they're prisoners, right? Then you add the layer of race on that, you've got a very complex situation. Now, State's Attorney Kim Fox also called Sunday and Monday's looting blatant criminal behavior and says that that is different than the peaceful protesters. She says she won't use her office's resources to go after, but her opponent in November's general election, that's Republican former Judge Pat O'Brien, called her a criminal's best friend. He says Fox needs to cooperate with police to pursue criminals in ways that cops cannot. You can't have an adversarial relationship with the police if you're the prosecutor. Otherwise, you're not gonna get anywhere and everybody in the city and suburbs and county is at risk. She's not protecting us. But Sarah Strout with the Appleseed Fund says it's not as open and shut as that. It's not that simple because the reasons that people commit crimes aren't that simple. Uh, you know, we know that people commit retail theft for a huge range of reasons. This is not your, tr your traditional sort of, you know, poverty motivated or substance use motivated feeling, but there's a lot of anger out there. And addressing that anger is something also that our, our elected officials are in charge of doing. Especially, she says, in times like these, there should not be a rush to judgment. 2020 is an unprecedented year. It's an incredibly painful year for all of us. Everyone is dealing with problems and emotions that we did not expect. She says it's going to take time to figure out what is behind the upheaval that Chicago just experienced. Now, prior to that weekend looting, the president of the Loop Alliance, Michael Edwards, says area businesses had been recovering from COVID closures, albeit slowly. Now it's another phase of recovery made all the more complicated because of COVID-19. The best security for State Street is more people. And so what people are tend to forget is that because of COVID, there is 30% as many people on State Street as there were a year ago. And when there's no people, it is difficult to keep a place, it's more difficult to keep a place safe. And so we are working with the uh, Chicago Police Department. They are providing ongoing services for us. Of course, we would like more. We always want more.
that security isn't the only action the alliance is taking in the face of what happened this weekend and really overall to make the area both safe and Edwards as welcoming. The alliance for a while now has had a street team. So some of the team helps passers by with things like directions. Others are unarmed, unarmed by the way, security guards. Because of COVID-19, State Street now also has outdoor restrooms for those who need it, including the homeless. And so Edward says part of it is directing people to that. But the organization is also doing anti-racist training and hopes to extend that to member businesses to make State Street, he says, feel more welcoming after a survey found that black people don't feel welcome there. Now, meanwhile, other officials and activists say that this continued cutoff of access into downtown starting at 9 p.m., that is another form of punishment that hurts residents living in neighborhoods, but who need to get access into the heart of the city. Paris, or in Brenda's, that is, back to you. That's all right, thanks, Amanda. And now we go to Paris uh, for more on the aftermath of yesterday's storm, Paris. Thanks, Brandis. Crews are out today cleaning up after last night's sudden wild storm that left around 7,000 trees snapped and uprooted, cars and windows smashed, and thousands of homes without power across the city. Here to take us through the twists and turns of last night's derecho is atmospheric scientist Scott Collis at the Argonne National Laboratory. Scott, great to see you. Thanks, Paris. All right, remind us, Scott, what exactly is a derecho? So derecho is a, it's a Spanish word for straight. It is a special type of storm that forms when lots of storms uh, interact through the wind motions and actually form a solid straight line. And this solid straight line of storms plus the variation of wind speeds from the surface up into the atmosphere lets these storms live for a very long time. And it seemed like this one came fast and furious. So how did this develop? So this storm developed out actually at the Nebraska-Iowa border. There was really warm, moist air at the surface and cold air that had kind of blown from the Arctic up in the middle of the atmosphere, about 13,000 feet upwards. And so this formed with just a line of storms that then started rolling along and actually started to pick up speed from the interaction between the air that comes out of a storm, we call that the downdraft, and the very, very strong winds just above the surface. At one stage, it was moving at over 75 miles per hour. Wow. And, it, you know, it's, we were so inundated with the news from the night before about what happened in Chicago. It seemed like this kind of came with only a few hours warning. When did meteorologists know that this was going to be big? This was a tough one to forecast because the right atmospheric conditions needed to exist. These only really started to be a real high probability um, yesterday morning. So if you look at the evolution of the warnings from the Storm Prediction Center, we were upgraded from a slight to a moderate chance of severe weather around about 9 a.m. in the morning. And the remarkable thing is that once we had our morning balloon flights, they sent these weather balloons up through the atmosphere around about 11 o'clock uh, in the morning Chicago time, we had our first storm watch was told the area that we were going to expect uh, severe weather later that day. Yeah, as I said, it just happened so fast and furious. And then the other thing that happened was a small tornado touchdown in Rogers Park. Having lived in Chicago most of my life, we were always told that uh, tornadoes would never really touch down in the city proper because of the effect of Lake Michigan. So tell us how rare this event is. Well, that's actually a really common falsehood um, because if the winds are strong enough and they're blowing the uh, air back onto the lake, uh, we don't care about Lake Michigan anymore. We care about the air that's coming from downstream of us. One of the reasons why you don't hear much about tornadoes here in the city of Chicago is the city of Chicago is just a very small target. So statistically speaking, it's quite rare for one to have a direct hit on the city. So um, the National Weather Service has confirmed an enhanced Brigitte scale level one tornado in Rogers Park. Um, but the ironic thing about this is EF1 has winds of 86 to 100 miles per hour. We actually had widespread winds across the area of 70 plus miles per hour. That's what makes a derecho a particularly damaging storm because you can get near tornadic winds over stretches of hundreds, sometimes even thousands of miles. 
And, and the damage is so widespread. So you're saying EF1, that tornado was an EF1, and we had winds all across the area that, that were close to that level. So put this into context. How does what happened yesterday compare to hurricanes? It's hurricane season right now to, to yep, other yep. severe storms. So yes, it is like, actually it's quite amusing, it is like a small hurricane. This is our version of a hurricane in the Midwest, not just in terms of the strength of the winds, but actually a lot of the atmospheric physics is kind of the same. The idea of these small individual storms that we normally see, they pop up, they rain and they go away because all that cold air because of the water in the uh, downdraft tends to wipe out these storms. But these ones, because of the direction of the wind and the strength of the wind, the air that comes out actually interacted with the air that came in and formed what we call an organized storm, where all the physics just works together. A similar thing happens in the spin up of hurricanes. So it's, it's clearly a, a, just a unique event yesterday. All right, Scott Collis, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paris. And now, Brandis, we go back to you for a look at the president's push to ban a social media site. Brandis. TikTok's time in the United States might be running out soon. The Trump administration recently issued an executive order sanctioning the parent company of the popular video sharing app ByteDance, citing privacy concerns. The Chinese social media company has until the middle of September to find an American buyer or be banned in the U.S but they're putting up a fight and are reportedly planning to sue the administration. Joining us with more on this legal battle is Harold Krent, a law professor at IIT Chicago, Kent College of Law. Harold, welcome back to Chicago tonight. First, is it in within the executive powers to ban an app like this? So the president has used the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, which was originally enacted in 1977 to reduce executive power. Um, and the he has identified TikTok as a potential threat to U.S. security. So under this Emergency Powers Act, he's entitled to focus on some kind of threat, be it terrorist attack during the Bush administration or during the Iran hostage investigation. We also used it to target some kind of foreign influence which might create a risk of security to the United States. So he's within his power, but the question is, is it a wise use of power? And does he have any kind of data to substantiate his findings? Right, because one of the questions is obviously, um, you know, one of his reasonings is national uh, security. Are security officials saying that TikTok or its parent company is a threat? Well, there was some kind of concern because the Senate just passed something a, a while ago which suggested that military officials and Defense Department officials should not be using TikTok because there is a fear that the Chinese um, com company that owns TikTok can scrape the data and find out things that may be incriminating to, to people that may give rise to some kind of pressure situation or give the foreign government influence over what we're doing in this country. But let me add, that is possible with all social media companies. If you take Facebook, if you take Twitter, if you take anything else, there's a tremendous amount of privacy information and there are no laws banning the company from mining that information to get a good sense of what individuals would do, what apps they use, where they navigate, which can all be done through TikTok as well. So how could you enforce something like this? Like you can't tell me to delete the app from my phone necessarily. So the way that people think that it can start is by telling Apple and by telling Google to delist uh, TikTok as an app that you can use through those mechanisms. That is not going to eliminate the use of TikTok by 100 million Americans uh, estimated today, uh, but it may uh, at least slowly over time release it. We could take more dramatic action, try to get into the backbone, the connection between um, the uh, Chinese company and the network here, but that would be much more dramatic, much more difficult, and people will doubt the administration would do this. More likely, this is just a move with the Trump administration to in the trade war with China, because after all, Facebook can't operate in China, so the Trump administration, even though he's no lover of Facebook, is saying, look, it's just not fair, so we're gonna make some kind of retaliatory move against you. Or it could even be more petty than that, and because people using TikTok supposedly trolled the Trump rally and Tulsa leading the Trump administration to believe that more people would show out, show up than actually did. 
who knows? But I doubt that there's any kind of findings suggesting that there's a real security threat from the Chinese owners of TikTok to democracy in the United States. Could this turn into a fight about the First Amendment? So the First Amendment angle is, uh, I think it's there. I'm not sure that it's the real uh, legal smoking gun here, but there are two kind of First Amendment theories of the problems of the case. One is that by banning TikTok, the administration is favoring some social platforms over others, which is true, but that's based upon foreign ownership and some kind of security findings that are not released to the public. The second theory is there may be some kind of other apps um, that are along with TikTok that actually convey information. And so that the convey the ability of people to get information in the United States will be curtailed because of this action against TikTok. Um, that's ancillary to getting rid of the video sharing platform that TikTok is, uh, but I guess that that's possible as well. I don't think that these are, are very strong arguments against the president. I mean, ironically, if the president review just like an administrative agency, it's likely that this would be thrown out of court. He didn't talk to TikTok first. He didn't share his information. There's no clear, concise findings to support what he's doing, but it's very unlikely that this kind of executive emergency order will ever be reviewed in court. Okay, so obviously something to keep our eye on. Uh, Harold Krent, thanks so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. Still to come on the program, Chicago Tonight is just getting started. Will CPS benefit from the city's surprising TIF surplus that's 10% higher than last year's record windfall? Along the Chicago Riverwalk, we'll give you a close-up look at a massive new work of public art taking flight. What are the changes and challenges waiting for college students in the upcoming school year? Working on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, just to get by. And we visit an open mic in a Southside community garden. And there's a new headliner in the sky, how you can catch the Perseid meteor shower tonight, after Chicago tonight, of course, can't go anywhere yet. But first, some of today's top stories. College sports fans may be disappointed to learn that the Big Ten Conference has postponed all fall sports due to the pandemic. In a statement, Commissioner Kevin Warren says, quote, as time progressed and after hours of discussion with our Big Ten Task Force for Emerging Infectious Diseases and the Big Ten Sports Medicine Committee, it became abundantly clear that there was too much uncertainty regarding potential medical risks to allow our student athletes to compete this fall. This announcement includes, of course, football, but also cross country, field hockey, soccer, and women's volleyball. The conference says it will continue to evaluate options, including playing in the spring. And late this afternoon, the Pac-12 conference announced it would also be postponing the fall sports season. Travelers to and from Kansas, Utah, and Iowa are no longer required to quarantine for 14 days after returning from those states. The city has removed them from its quarantine list. 20 others still remain. Today, the Illinois Department of Public Health announces another 1,500 confirmed cases of the coronavirus and an additional 20 deaths. The state's new case total now stands at nearly 197,000 and more than 7,600 deaths. Mosquitoes, though, are not canceled due to the pandemic. The Chicago Department of Public Health says neighbors in South Lawndale, Brighton Park, and Archer Heights will notice mosquito spraying trucks in their communities this Thursday evening. CDPH says based on citywide mosquito surveillance, spraying is needed in these three communities to protect against West Nile virus. This is the first spraying to occur in the city this season. And now to Phil Ponce and the debate over how to spend sur surplus TIF funds. Phil. The pandemic shutdown, there was a bit of good news last week. Revenue collected by Chicago's tax increment financing districts hit a new high of $926 million. That's up more than 10% from last year. A TIF district captures revenue that's pulled out of a specific district for more than 20 years. Instead of the money being sent to the general tax base to pay for schools and parks and other needs, it's put right back into that specific district for redevelopment projects to eradicate blight. But if the city declares a surplus, then the city 
can spend the money outside the TIP district. In fact, last year, Mayor Lori Lightfoot declared a $300 million surplus. About half of that went to CPS and $74 million to the city. Joining us to talk about how TIFs should be spent are Walter Burnett, 27th Ward Alderman, which includes the West Loop, West Humboldt Park, East Garfield Park, and parts of the near north side. And Leslie Hairston, Alderman of the 5th Ward on the south side, which includes Hyde Park and South Shore. She's a member of the Progressive Caucus. Thank you both for joining us. We very much appreciate it. As we mentioned, it's uh, it's conceivable that the mayor could declare a, turf, a TIF surplus in excess of $300 million. Uh, Alderman Harrison, should a big chunk of that go to fill what's expected to be a big budget hole in the city's projected budget? That way, the city could avoid property taxes, property tax hikes, or layoffs. What do you think? Well, I definitely think um, we we are also, uh, we're, we're going to have to look at that. But let me just add that I also represent the communities of Woodlawn and Greater Grand Crossing. I didn't want to leave them out. Um, you know, I, I, I think we're going to have to look at uh, giving some to CPS. Um, but definitely, uh, we want to stay out of the taxpayers' pockets. Alderman, I, I, uh, Alderman Burnett, how about it? Uh, yeah. Should a big chunk of that go to filling the uh, hole that's expected to be uh, a big one, given what the city's going through because of COVID? Yeah, definitely. And, and I've been blessed to have a ward to have the healthy TIFs. A lot of those surpluses come from my ward and the 42nd Ward, where a lot of development is happening. And, and I'm always happy to see that that surplus go to help fix the budget, but when it fix our budget, it fixes the board education budget, the county's budget, the forest preserve, the park district, and the water reclamation district. So I think everyone is going to need, they're, they're going to need some help uh, right now because of what's happening with our economy with the COVID-19 situation. Alderman Harrison, as I mentioned, you're a member of the Progressive Caucus. Some, some critics of TIFs see them as inherently racist because they say they uh, TIFs divert money away from communities of color and give money to developers who might have gone ahead with a project anyway. How do you see it? So, uh, you know, I, I have a, a couple of TIFs in my ward, um, and TIFs initially, when they were created in the 1970s in, in southern Illinois, uh, to, to deal with economic development. They are an economic development tool. They are purposely meant for blighted areas, um, I, I, uh, areas that need help with economic development. And so that's exactly what I've done um, on the South Side and, and many other aldermen on the South Side have done so. Um, the purpose that the TIF is created is created in a blighted area that otherwise would not attract economic development to attract economic development. I know people don't remember Ro Roosevelt Road was commonly referred to as Skid Row uh, when I believe it was Madeline Haithcock, uh, then of the second ward, created the TIF so that she could bring some economic development to that neighborhood. And, and we've been able to use TIF in a lot of ways, but I would say since 2011, about $4.8 billion have gone, gone, has gone toward public infrastructure, went toward schools, parks, you know, everything um, that we need in the public where the park district didn't have enough money, the schools didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough money for infrastructure, the TIF dollars paid for all of those things. So what it actually did was front loaded a lot of things that these bodies would have had to wait for over years to get in order to spend that money on projects that they needed to do. Let's switch uh, topics uh, and talk about the looting that's taken place recently. Uh, Alderman Harrison, is there more that the uh, mayor and the police can be doing? What do you think? So I think there are a couple of things that we need to be doing uh, that, that we are kind of have been slow on. Um, following the federal consent decree, uh, you know, creating uh, a, a, a public body, a, a review, accountability, um, those are things that we've been talking about, but we have not acted on, and it's time for us to act. And uh, Alderman uh, Burnett, uh, what message do you have for for people who people who took part in the looting? So, you know, uh, I had a conversation today with a 24-year-old. Um, you know, we can't hurt the hand that feed us. Uh, when we loot downtown, when we when we loot a lot of those businesses, we don't recognize that most of the tax dollars that come from those areas 
help to supplement the west and the south sides. Uh, if, if, if downtown is gone, there go the city of Chicago. Uh, so we need to keep our our uh, financial engines in place in order so that we can get those monies on the west and the south side. As a matter of fact, all of the money that's going to the to to the invest southwest is coming from the downtown areas, and that, those are the monies that's being used to invest in the west and the south side. So we have to. We have to learn about the the balance. I look at it as a Robin Hood syndrome, where downtown and places where development and developers are attracted to brings money in, so that we can use them in other areas that need them. And a quick reaction, Alderman Harrison, to the selection of Joe Biden of Kamala Harris as his running mate. A good pick. I, it is a good pick for me. I was an early supporter of uh, Kamala Harris. Um, and um, I think she is an excellent choice, quite frankly. And Oliver Burnett, your reaction? I think this is very exciting. Uh, it's very exciting to have an African-American woman as the uh, uh, vice president uh, candidate. Uh, I think this is going to really motivate so many people to get engaged and get involved in this election coming up. I think it means a lot to have her right there in a spot where if something was to happen to the president, she can be the president. I mean, this is fantastic. We're so excited about it. Uh, people, I was just on the phone with folks when it happened. And we couldn't even talk. Everybody was just talking about that. And everyone is so excited about it. I think it's great. Alderman Burnett, Alderman Harrison, thank you both. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, what college students can expect when they resume classes this fall. But first, a look at the weather. Colleges and universities are preparing for a new semester unlike any other. For many, the welcome back won't be to campus. Instead, it'll be online courses as higher education adjusts to the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining us to discuss changes to the fall semester are Brian Caputo, president of the College of DuPage, David Slavsky, vice provost and director of the Office of Institutional Effectiveness at Loyola University, Chicago, and Robin Neal Kaler, Associate Chancellor for Public Affairs at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome to Chicago tonight, everyone. Um, so obviously in the spring, everyone made a very abrupt shift over to online learning. David Slavsky, uh, let's start with you, please. What has the summer looked like as Loyola started to prepare for the fall semester? We've had, uh, we have a bit of an advantage at Loyola. We've been offering online classes for about 17 years. So we have the expertise and infrastructure to have made that sharp, sharp switch, as you refer to. We put 3,400 sections online in nine days. Uh, that, that was quite a remarkable achievement, required a lot of teamwork. We made the assumption that it's turning out to be a good one uh, in May that it, there was a high likelihood that we would have to teach all of our classes online this fall. So we began preparing once the spring semester began. We, we announced very early that all of our summer courses would be online and we've adapted all of our courses to be in the online format. Over the summer, we've had over a thousand faculty go through training offered by our Center for Ignatian Pedagogy and our Office of Online Learning. So you're right, this is a semester like none other, but we believe we're prepared for it. Uh, Brian Caputo, about 20% of classes at the College of DuPage will be in person. Um, how will classes be different for students this year? Well, uh, it will be a bit of a different semester. First, as we enter the buildings, uh, there will be screeners uh, that will ask some questions of our students as to uh, have, they been a, had, have they had a temperature, have they been exposed in any way that they're aware of, and then we actually take their temperature at the doors. And then as they come in, they will be essentially directed down hallways in certain directions to maintain social distancing. And then when they get to the classrooms, the classrooms have been structured to be spaced out as well. Um, the in-person the in classrooms are generally very small, 17 to 20 to maintain that social distance. Okay, sounds like some good old fashioned hall monitoring, like you said. Exactly. Uh, Robin Neal Kaler, how is the University of Illinois supporting those international students? Um, same, same as all the other students, you know, we're providing uh, whatever resources uh, they need. If they cannot get to the states, for example, uh, they'll be able to access courses online. 
Um, we have a lot of students from China and we actually have an agreement with uh, ZJU University. So our business, our engineering and some of our liberal arts students who can't get here from China will actually go and study with our faculty on site there. So they actually will have a, an in-person experience just somewhere else. David Slavsky, last week Loyola announced that it would be closing its residence halls. What led you all to make that decision? We've been monitoring, as I'm sure every college and university in America has been, very closely the data about the COVID crisis. We've been reading all of the literature and following the numbers. On June 22nd, which was the day we reopened registration for the uh, fall semester, is probably the day we were most hopeful that we could have some significant on-campus experience for our students. The seven-day rolling average of new cases per day in the United States was a little over 22,000. Uh, rolling average of the number of deaths per day was uh, 630 or so. By the time we made our internal decision in early August, the new cases number had increased by over 100%. The death, daily death figure had increased by 81%. This coupled with the fact that the recent surge in the virus was dominantly in the 18 to 29 age group and reading the medical reports that even if the mortality rate in that age group is low, the mortality rate in my age group is, is not. And finding the evidence of the virus in neurological tissue, in heart tissue, all of these things combined to let us know that, to make us think this is not the right decision. And we felt that the right decision and really the only decision for us would be not to have students on campus this fall. It's it's a heartbreaking decision. All of us in higher education are there because we right. love students. Well, and, and the University of Illinois, Robin, you all are doing twice weekly testing for anyone who is on campus. Twice, twice weekly testing, that sounds expensive. Are you all hoping that it will prevent a spike in cases there on campus? Well, we know there'll be some sort of increase when we bring so many people back to campus. But yes, some of our faculty um, have developed uh, a saliva-based test uh, that we've been using all summer um, and will require everybody to do it twice weekly. We've had faculty um, who have done data modeling that shows that when you combine that with our uh, you know, requirements to, for face coverings and the social distancing and all of the other measures that we put in place, that uh, it does allow us to bring uh, you know, a lower number of people back to the uh, campus. And so anybody who doesn't need to be there is being asked to continue working remotely. Okay, and before I let you all go, Brian Caputo, you know, we're hearing that some students are choosing to enroll in community college instead of continuing to a four-year university if classes are online. What's enrollment looking like for the College of DuPage? Well, enrollment is actually looking quite good. Um, we are, we've had about 4% increase in our requests for admission, our applications, and that's very f positive. And we're hoping that'll carry over into the fall into actual registrations. We're offering uh, instruction in three different modes. Uh, we have it in the tra traditional sort of online, and then we have virtual class meeting, which is essentially a live meeting with a professor, but it's just online, and then a hybrid, which is really reserved for those courses where you can't achieve the learning objectives in an online environment. Uh, this would be such things as chemistry labs and welding uh, labs, that sort of thing. So an interesting looking semester. We look forward to discussing it again with you all uh, sometime in the future. My thanks to Brian Caputo, David Slavsky, and Robin Neal Kaler. Thanks to you all for joining us. Thank you. Summer is the season for public art. It seems like every week a colorful new mural blooms. The city granted us access to get up close to a massive new painting project along the Chicago Riverwalk. Arts producer Mark Vitale has that story. Look closely and you can see it from across the river. It takes up two levels. And when you're on the river walk, look up to really appreciate it. The name of this ambitious work is The Radiance of Being. The Radiance of Being was a mural that we came up with to celebrate 100 years of Art Deco. We ended up taking motifs from a handful of buildings all around Chicago, making a collage of all of them and creating this imagery, a beautiful scene to represent all the different buildings that were built during the Art Deco period. A docent at the Chicago Architecture Center gave the artist a tour of all things Art Deco in Chicago. When we went around to see Art Deco architecture, there are a lot of universal motifs, a lot of swirls, a lot of um, long and lengthy line work and geometry. 
Uh, something that I ended up finding in a lot of the buildings we went to were bird motifs, and that's why I chose to focus on having a lot of birds and musicians in this one, a lot of flora and fauna as well. When planning a mural like this, it helps if you're good at math. Murals, I think, in general are very mathematical. I actually studied math in college. I never studied art, so... It's uh, over 3,500 square feet. In the upper area, it's 110 feet long by 15 at the longest section. And the lower area here is another 180 feet and another 50 feet wrapping around the bottom. So, biggest one I've done yet. <laughs> the city initiated the project and put out a call to artists for proposals to brighten the area next to and above the river walk. We had this great big beautiful empty wall that we thought we should put a mural on. One of the most fun features of the Riverwalk is the public art, and we've been doing different rotations of different kinds of artworks since the Riverwalk has been in existence. I was really proud to be a part of an all-female team that executed this. You know, there were three of us female painters, two female filmmakers. It was really empowering to be a part of that, and that was important to me through this process. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. It's called The Radiance of Being, and it's just west of Michigan Avenue along the Chicago Riverwalk. Don't forget to look up. And up next, Paris Schutz has details on how to catch a glimpse of tonight's meteor shower. Stick around. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Comet Neowise dominated our skies and mines earlier this summer, but look out world, there's another headliner in the sky, and it's not a second act. The annual Perseid meteor shower is taking over tonight and early tomorrow, but there have already been reports of early Perseids observed from Chicago and elsewhere. And joining us with more on when and how to watch the meteor shower is WTTW news reporter Patty Wetley. Patty, great to see you. Hey, Paris. <laughs> All right, so when should be, we be on the lookout for the Perseid meteor shower? Where's the best place to see it? Yeah, so the Perseids have actually been in action in the skies already, but we're talking about this is peak Perseid time right now. So tonight, after midnight, into the wee hours of tomorrow morning before sunrise. Those are the ideal hours and you want to find a dark place. So, you know, that's tough to find in the city, but get away from as many street lights and porch lights as you can and to have like an open view of the sky. And then basically all you have to do is look up and you should see some. And that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, you got the light pollution in the city. All right, so go, right. To, a, go to a dark <laughs> corner of the city and look up at the yes. sky. And how yeah. long is this going to be going on for? So this will last for like another 10 days. So right now the challenge is that the moon is at three quarters. So it's actually letting off a lot of glare that might be obscuring some of the meteors. So if you wait a little bit beyond peak when the moon starts to fade a bit or when it actually goes away, um, has completely waned, you have through like the 24th of August that you could actually be able to see them. So if you want to wait a little bit past peak, that would be great as well. All right, I'm a night owl, so I'm going to go check it out tonight. And if I don't see it tonight, I'll check it out tomorrow. All right, Patty, yeah, thank you exactly. so much. Thanks, Paris. And you can read Patty's full story on our website, where you can also find out how to watch the meteor shower from the comfort of your couch if you're planning for a night in. It's all at WTTW.com news. 15 people were shot outside a funeral home in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood on Chicago's south side three weeks ago. But just six blocks away, young Chicagoans are expressing their art in a community garden that provides nutritional food to the area. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia visited a new open mic event to learn more. What if I never get famous and never get money and I am stuck smoking weed and getting hot till I'm dummy, I never thought. High school student Tyrell Jerry is performing his song Before It All Ends. And it was basically just a, a song about how I feel when like, like I'm doing all this hard work to get somewhere and it's just like, what if it all never happens? And it was just like my, pers my like thoughts on that. I think, just that piece, I think. It's the first open mic at the garden maintained by students from the Community Youth Development Institute, a charter school in the Auburn-Gresham neighborhood on Chicago's yeah. south side. Are you all going to do a cypher now? Yeah. yeah. 
We are an alternative high school and we do cater to all youth. You don't necessarily have to be a, a bad student to join our school, but our school is definitely full of students who want more out of life, but haven't been handed the best deck of cards. Smoking on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, just to get by. Instructor Michelle Alvarez says students from other high schools are stepping in to care for the garden since COVID-19 eliminated her institute's program. The open mic was their idea. Of course, but not really. Yes, but not really. I don't want to live my life like that, Rosalind. When they work hard, basically, maintaining the garden, they want to show you another side of them. So, like I said, a lot of our students are from Shy Arts Academy, De La Salle High School, and they want to be able to show their creative sides. Christ Almighty, try working for a living. The talking, talking, talking. Jesus Christ, can't he ever shut up? Making my way to the stage while I'm leading my way to the grave. June is a performer and one of several young vendors selling their products at the garden. This going on on 77th and Halstead, right from 79th. Yes, there are certain infamous qualities about Chicago, but you have to think about what is the realistic scale of people living in these neighborhoods, of people living in food deserts. You're coming here and you have to get fed by your own neighborhood. So this is the community feeding itself, and that feels very great. It's an amazing thing. They can get to be much, much bigger than this. Disaster can. After their first open mic, organizers plan to hold the event every Wednesday evening and invite other young people to perform. Money, 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 yeah, that's all that's on my mind. She told me she loved me, but I see right through the lines. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. And if you've got talent, feel free to join the open mic, which runs every Wednesday night from 4 to 7. There's also a farmer's market from Monday to Thursday at the Garden on 77th and Halstead Streets. You can visit our website to learn more and to watch some video of the several turkeys living on that site. And before we go, some viewer feedback. Some of you weighed in on State Representative LaShawn Ford's call to abolish teaching history in Illinois schools. Ford says yes. history lessons in their current forms foment white supremacy and racism. History is important. Just teach the truth, the good and the bad. If we don't know how we got here, how do we know where we are? You can't erase history. All you can do is learn from the bad and do better for the future. All of this energy you're wasting on the past could be making a better future for the children that are on Earth today. On a recent appearance of Chicago Tonight, a couple of you noticed something in the background behind infectious disease Dr. Emily Landon. Our reporter Kristen Tometz did as well, and it sparked a follow-up story on Landon's pandemic hobby, making soap. Thanks for this story. I had wondered about those objects on the shelves behind her. Such a wonderful sh story. Thanks for sharing. Our current stress from the pandemic is at an all time high. This sounds like a fun and relaxing hobby. I'm glad Dr. Landon gets to carve out this time for herself. And as always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram or post your comments on our website. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at seven. Now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. And we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm named by elite lawyers as the top aviation firm in the country in 2020.